Okay, everybody, um, welcome to today's event. My name is Michael Emmerich. I teach Japanese literature in the, in the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures here at UCLA. Uh, I'm really delighted to be able to welcome you to this event. This is the second uh, in a series of two events, or well, actually three, I guess there was one uh, two days ago at the last bookstore. There was another event yesterday uh, at USC, and this is the last and final, and hopefully, uh, or and I expect the best. Uh, event in this series of uh, three celebrating uh, monkey business, which I won't say anything about because Roland Kelts, the author of Japan America, uh, who was involved in the creation of uh, this magazine, is going to do that uh, instead. He'll also introduce the participants in today's event. So uh, without further ado, uh, join me in welcoming Roland Kelts. Thank you very much for coming uh, today. We, um, this is a, a first for us uh, at Monkey Business. We have launch events and have had launch events for the past four years in New York City uh, during the Golden Week, the Japanese holidays, Golden Week, which fortunately coincides with the Penn World Voices Festival, which is an international literary festival in New York City. So we try to partner with Penn, and we do a week of launch events in New York City every May. We sort of branched out to Toronto, where one of the co-editors, uh, translators of this journal, Monkey Business, uh, is a professor at York University, Ted Goosen. And so we did some events in Toronto. And then last year, we, uh, we came to this coast, and we did some events in the Bay Area. So this time, we're taking it a few steps farther we did uh, San, San Diego over the weekend, UC San Diego. Uh, Monday, we were at the last bookstore in downtown Los Angeles. Great, great venue. Um, yesterday, we were at the University of Southern California for a couple of events. And as, uh, as Michael said, we're here for the best of them all at UCLA this evening. So um, it's, a, it's a, the first time for us to be sort of trekking up the West Coast. Um, Monkey Business is the journal we're here to, uh, to, to launch and to celebrate. This is issue four, which is the latest issue of Monkey Business. Uh, issue five, I'm happy to say, is currently underway and will be published around February or March of next year, uh, issue five, and will feature many wonderful works, but also uh, some of you may know the uh, Japanese novelist Haruki Murakami, and he's contributed an original essay to yes. Monkey Business number five. So we're looking forward to that publication. In the meantime, we have all four publications, Monkey Business in English, one through four, available this evening uh, for sale after the event. And the authors here, whose work is featured in those journals, uh, will, be, uh, will be happy to sign for you. Uh, this is a kind of one, once in a lifetime event. <laughs> so uh, it's a chance to get those uh, copies signed. Quickly, a little, little quick history about Monkey Business. Um, I met the founding editor and, and translator of Monkey Business in uh, 2002, a long time ago, in New York City, uh, coincidentally at a reading by Haruki Murakami, who was in New York City for the New Yorker Festival uh, in 2002. As it turned out, I and Professor Motoyuki Shibata were both writing about that event for Japanese publications. And it's really quite fitting because the idea was to, to write for a Japanese audience about a Japanese novelist in New York City. So this kind of boomerang of uh, rhetoric, if you will, trying to describe what Haruki Murakami looks like, what he says, how he's perceived when he's thousands of miles away in New York City. And, uh, <clears throat> Subsequently, I met uh, Moto several times in Tokyo, and we discussed all kinds of ideas, particularly about literature. And in 2006, we were invited to collaborate on a Japanese, uh, what they call the literary portfolio, for an American journal called A Public Space, which is published out of Brooklyn. It's a quarterly literary journal founded br by Bridget Hughes, who worked for 10 years with George Plimpton at the Paris Review. So before we get into all that gossip about literary magazines, uh, she founded Public Space in 2006, and the very first issue featured a Japanese literature portfolio, uh, in English, of course, that was put together by Moto Shibata and, and me. And it featured uh, Haruki Murakami, it featured uh, Masaya Nakahara, 
uh, Kazushige Abe, um, who was translated by Michael Emmerich, the professor here tonight. Um, and we put that together, and it, happy to say that issue sold out right away um, because of our portfolio, of course, and uh, also sold uh, several copies in Japan as well. Uh, so it's now a kind of collector's item, the first issue of a public space. But it was a lot of fun, and it's one of the reasons that uh, Moto decided to found his own literary journal in Japan called Monkey Business. And that was, of course, in Japanese when it was launched in 2008. But around 2010, Ted Goosen talked to Moto about the idea of publishing this magazine with the same brand, if you will, in English. And to take some of the material from the original Japanese monkey business, but to also be much more eclectic in a sense, and to include uh, works by American writers, uh, works by uh, uh, posthumous works by Japanese uh, novelists, uh, traditional uh, novelists, historical novelists, uh, to include uh, haiku, tanka, poetry, uh, to include manga. Uh, in fact, the manga in these issues uh, is quite striking, uh, as you'll see if when you take a look. Um, uh, some based on uh, Franz Kafka's short stories, for example. Um, to also include fo photographs, uh, visual art. So um, I like to think of this magazine as um, an example of what James Joyce's vision was for Ulysses. Joyce wanted to write a book that you could open anywhere and enter into the stream of narrative and, uh, and feel the feelings in the story and, and dive right in. And I feel that way about monkey business. You can really open it just about anywhere and dive into the world uh, created by the translators and the authors and the poets and photographers and manga artists present in the publications. So uh, Ted and Moto came to me. I went back to Bridget Hughes at a public space, and we created a partnership that has enabled us to publish this annual edition in English. And I have to thank the, uh, our sponsors, Nippon Foundation in Tokyo uh, has been very generous in supporting the publication of this print issue. Uh, we also have ebook versions uh, and we have a, a Tumblr site through which you can purchase the ebook versions. You can download from Amazon as well onto your Kindle or your um, tablet. Um, I also want to thank uh, uh, the Japan Foundation, particularly the Japan Foundation of Los Angeles this time around for generously supporting our live events, uh, these kinds of things that we're doing. As I said, in, uh, we're actually doing them in six cities in California on this tour. And they also support us in New York and, and in Toronto. So they're very, very important to us. As I mentioned, a public space, which is our partner uh, in the uh, publishing the English edition. Uh, and of course, this evening to thank uh, UCLA for hosting us and this uh, wonderful group of writers. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the the founding editor and translator of Monkey Business, Motoyuki Shibata. Thank you. Uh, hello, thank you for coming. My name is Moto Shibata. I run the uh, Monkey Business magazine. Uh, before I introduce the authors, uh, I like to talk a little bit about the title of our magazine. People often ask me why we call ourselves Monkey Business. It's a literary journal. Uh, we initially wanted to call ourselves simply story because we wanted our journal to be full of good stories and we also wanted to pay respects to the uh, great uh, American literary journal which was around until 10 years ago uh, simply called story uh, but we found that it turned out that uh, there was a, a Japanese fashion magazine called story and they had the copyrights up to the title. And uh, we uh, took a look at the magazine and we didn't think it was very good, so uh, we thought it would discontinue after a while because economy was bad and ja magazines are, are, are discontinuing uh, one after another, but they didn't and uh, the magazine is still going on strong. So we had to think of some other title and it occurred to us that uh, uh, in Japanese literary scene uh, there is uh, the, the, it, it's so serious and uh, Chuck Berry uh, sang about too much monkey business but uh, 
we thought in the literary、uh, world、uh, there was too much serious business and too little monkey business. So we、uh, decided to call ourselves monkey business. That's it. Okay,、uh, I'd like to introduce the author, authors uh, uh, Hideo Furukawa.、Um, <laughs> He's、uh, written about、uh, Arabia from the Middle Ages or、uh, Tokyo in the near future. Uh, or he uh, started writing a seven part、uh, history of the 20th century focusing on rock and roll and ended up writing a、uh, uh, 21 uh, uh, part、uh, history of. More than just the 20th century. I don't know what to describe it.、Uh, he, he ended up in, uh, 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 with, uh, with a, a thousand page、uh, huge novel. And、uh, he's also just completed a huge novel,、uh, which is a kind of a rewrite of the tale of Genji. And uh, the, uh, uh, the second author,、uh, Hiromi Ito.、Uh, <laughs> She's a poet and she's one of the most important voices to、uh, come out in the Japanese uh, 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 poetry scene in the latter half of the 20th century. And、uh, she's been living in San Diego、uh, since the mid 1990s. Yeah. 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 And uh, uh, she uh, spends、uh, a part of her time in Japan as well. Oh, 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 by the way,、uh, our, our uh, uh, general theme today is, uh, pl- is uh, uh, the sense of places, how we have been、uh, imagining other places, how we have been influenced uh, by uh, uh, literature uh, created in other places. And of course, uh, it, uh, with、uh, Hiromi's case, the place is, is, a, is a very uh, important uh, subject. And、uh, the third one, uh, uh, Tomoka Shibasaki. Uh, the, uh, the most uh, prestigious, uh, 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 highly uh, publicized、uh, literary journal in Japan is called the Akutagawa Award. And just recently, two months ago,、uh, she won the Akutagawa Award.、Uh, please congratulate her. <laughs> In her fiction, too,、uh, the, the, uh, the sense of place is、uh, very、uh, important. And she gives, gives us the sense of wonder about the fact that you can be at one place at one time, but through imagination, you can be at, another, at other places at,、uh, or in other times,、uh, places you've never been to or times you've never lived in. And uh, 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 although she uh, writes, uh, well, no, it's not although, sorry, she writes about, mostly about uh, uh, young women living in uh, uh, big cities, but uh, uh, her, her work is, is relevant uh, with uh, so many other things as well. And finally, we are very happy to、uh, have a writer from,、uh, from Los Angeles,、uh, Steve Erickson. To introduce Steve to uh, uh, people in Los Angeles is what we call、uh, Shakani Seppo, preaching Buddhism to Buddha. Uh, but uh, uh, sh- he, as you know,、uh, he has written nine novels,、uh, two books of nonfiction so far, and、uh, seven novels out of nine. Uh, have been translated into Japanese,、uh, three by me and four by others. And he has been hugely influential in Japan, inspiring uh, uh, young writers and readers. And uh, uh, Hideo Furukawa owes a lot to Steve. So we like to start,、uh, Hideo and I would like to start、uh, reading very briefly. Uh, from uh, one of、uh, his books, Tours of the Black Clock. Okay. March 1937. Yuki wa toke. Hai sui ko de kori ga wareru. The snow melts and the ice breaks in the gutters. 
カフェからカフェへと渡り歩く。And people hustle up and down the Kerntner Strasse from one coffee house to the next. 絵描きたちがステファン・セイドの周辺にイーゼルを立てる。霊気で絵の具が固まらないよう、彼らは小さな火を焚く。Painters set up their easels around St. Stephen's with little fires to keep the colors from hardening in the chill. Every once in a while, a palette gets too close to a flame. And you can hear little pops of ignition and hue all over the square. There's a smell of sugar, sugar, cologne, cabbage. The Hofburg rises at the middle of the Ringstrasse. Like a mountain range that's ripped itself loose from the ocean bottom and floated to the surface. Through the streets, wild dogs run in hers. Political bombing set of peals of goodness among the cafe crowd. Phony military guys in high black boots and brown uniforms march back and forth between the fountains. 1900. 1939 Love rages. It cries out from you, seething and red. I come back for more and more. These German knights we sit at the bottom of the well joined an impulse. In the mornings I climb up the rope of my love to the light where my child waits. Megan grows sadder. Her parents resume the stipend inspired by the grandchild and she gives up her life of crime. But the days are still disquieting. Austria の新聞はポーランドの挑発について書き立てスイスの新聞は別の見解を示す。Austrian papers scream of the Polish provocation. Swiss papers tell it differently. In September, the British declare war. And Megan's sorrow spreads like her hair on the pillow behind her head. All touch is lost with her nation and people. We are at war, I say to you. The happy delirium on your face at this news is unmistakable. You coo for defilement. Is he watching? You mutter beneath me. I look for his form in the shadows of the room. The heat inside you detonates me. By the end of the year, people in the street are certain the war will be a short one. When Holtz visits, I can tell he isn't so sure. He's dazed that events have gone this far. Many more Germans soon. 
Danes, Belgians, Dutch. One afternoon in the autumn of 1939, I'm standing at the Fox Garden with my little girl, now almost one and a half years old. She teaches precariously on her little legs. And as we were watching the Viennese strolling in the unnerved hours, I gaze around and I'm in a boat. The boat is on water with a thousand other small boats around us. A city floats in the lagoon behind us. The Adriatic Sea glistens to the east of us. A fisherman at the other end of the boat watches me knowingly. Everything in me aches. I'm old. I have a beard. It's 30 years from now. And lying in the bottom of the boat, wrapped in a brown cloak, is a very old man, white thin hair and dead eyes, gazing up at me. It's not a vision I'm having, or a dream. I feel the boat rocking as sure as anything I've ever felt. I look at the old man trying to remember who he is. Because I know I've seen him. And then I have this distant memory of 30 years before. When I caught his eye for several seconds through the hotel doorway. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the reason we uh, read this is Number one, we wanted to pay respects to Steve, uh, but also we wanted to uh, sort of disorient ourselves. Uh, it's a writing by a Los Angeles writer about Vienna, uh, uh, connecting, connected uh, through time to the Adriatic Sea, uh, read by a Japanese uh, writer and uh, uh, by a Japanese translator with Japanese accent. So uh, uh, and uh, now we wanted to we want to uh, further disorient ourselves. I, I'm, I, I ask Steve to read from one of his novels, "The Sea Came In at Midnight," about Tokyo. I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank uh, Moto and. Roland and Michael for putting this event together. Uh, I am moved and honored by that reading. Thank you. Um, I'm humbled to be here with other uh, really great writers. And I'm going to read just a couple pages from a novel that came out um, about 15 years ago now. Uh, this comes very close to the beginning of the story. So it won't be any more disorienting than it has to be. <laughs> a month ago, after arriving in Tokyo, but before she moved into this room on the top floor of the Hotel Rio, Kristen lived for a couple of weeks in a Ryokan over near the water. 
In her little room, she would tack her news clippings and articles to the wall, very much like she does here, above the little tea table in the corner. Every day, the maid would take them down. The maid never said a word to her, nor did Kristen to the maid. The two of them just locked in a silent battle of wills over the articles tacked to the wall. The maid clearly considered the decor unseemly. But Kristen hadn't come all the way from California some, so someone could tell her what she could or couldn't put on the walls. Then Kristen moved into the Rio, one of the revolving memory hotels of Tokyo's Kabukicho section amid the surrounding bars and brothels and strip joints and massage parlors and porn shops. Since she never dreams, she's particular, particularly aware in her sleep of the hum of the hotel's revolution. It's not exactly the hum of machinery or clockwork. It feels and sounds more like the vibration of a tuning fork in the walls of her room and in the floor, but neither a mat. When the revolving cylindrical hotel slides into alignment, alignment with one of the outer exits, it opens up into one of the passages that lead to random neighborhoods of the city. Depending on the time of day, the long, pulsing blue corridors sometimes deposit Kristen on the Ginza, and from there she walks to the bay not far from the outdoor market where the boats bring in fresh tuna in the early morning hours. Her first couple of weeks in Tokyo, when Kristen was living at the Ryokan, she would go down to the market every morning and breakfast on fresh sushi with extra wasabi, the strong green horseradish that she prefers to the fish. Now that she lives at the Rio, she sometimes goes down to the wharves, like this morning when, realizing the vendor was out of wasabi, she gravely rejected the, sh the sushi and pushed it back across the stall counter uneaten. Sorry, she shook her head. And the seething vendor exploded in highly indignant Japanese. Mm -hmm. They got into a heated argument despite the fact that neither actually understood anything the other was saying. Don't you see that the whole point of the sushi is the wasabi? She kept trying to tell him. He was what Kristen back in the States used to call a point user. In the gray day, the gray city disappears. It's possible an empirical investigation would reveal that during the day, there in fact is no Tokyo, only people wandering an empty plain overgrown with tufts of fog that take the shape of shops, homes, hotels, temples. But at night, the city blazes like an aquatic arcade, surfacing up through black water. And in the most labyrinthine city in the world, Kristen fixes herself to the cityscape by humming a song, any song, since Tokyo exists in a vibrating lull, a maelstrom of frantic motion in complete silence. No honking cars, no hawkers or of goods, no obscenity screaming pedestrians, just, a, just the hum of the subway like the sonic spine of Tokyo consciousness, or a hum in the air like the whirring revolution of the hotel that Kristen hears in her sleep. The song Kristen sings to herself these days is called April Skies by an English band from the 1980s. Maybe she sings this particular song because it happens to be April now. Hand in hand in a violet of life, making love on the edge of a knife, and the world comes tumbling down. At the shores of Tokyo Bay, she watches on the other side of the water the bright beacon of light that attracted her attention the first night she was here. She has no idea what makes the light or where it comes from. At night, it's too bright to be a window, too close to be a star. In the daylight, neither the light nor its source can be seen. Thank you very much, Steve. Okay. Uh, well, actually, uh, 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 Kabukicho 
and uh, Tsukiji are not that near, so it's impossible to come out of one exit to Kabukicho and the same building, uh, another exit to, to come out uh, to, to uh, Tsukiji. That's impossible, but it per uh, makes perfect sense in Steve's talking. Okay, uh, before we ask the, the other two writers to read from their own writing, uh, we like to uh, uh, discuss a little bit about uh, the, our subject tonight, uh, uh, how we have been uh, imagining other places, how we have been uh, influenced by uh, 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 literature uh, created in other places. So, Hiromi, uh, <laughs> Okay, so let's go. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Yeah, so uh, I should talk about the uh, uh, foreign literature. Sure. Could you, could you say that? I want to sing. So oh, yeah, how you have been influenced by uh, uh, literature from other countries. Other countries, yes. yeah. You know, since we are Japanese and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this minor culture, and minor language, and most of the stuff were translated. That's right. When we were a child. And so, you know, I loved any kind of stuff, even if, you know, they're talking, uh, they're talking about something I've never seen, mm -hmm. I've never eaten, but I was so fascinated about reading any kind of st stories mm -hmm. about unfamiliar food or places. But then, uh, when I started to write poetry, I was 18, 20 or something like that. I helped my professor was translating an uh, uh, American poet. It's called Shiv Shidarin. And I, I'm sure you guys don't know. And I, I've been asking people, but mm. nobody knows that. Mm. But then she was at that time maybe late 30s, and then she was a feminist poet. And then writing very strongly, you know, mm. very feminist stuff means, you know, using a lot of bad words. Mm can't fuck or that kind of stuff. And then I just helped the translation and the, the, I just started to write poetry and mm. then really came to my mm. mind mm. very directly. This is from the 1970s, 80s? Uh, Mid-70s. Mid-70s. Yeah. Okay. And then meantime, uh, I read... What's uh, Ginsburg? Ginsburg. Yeah. What's the first name? Alan Ginsburg. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, I thought poetry is, you know, we are writing this way, you guys are writing right. this way, but then a very p compact and then, you know, <coughs> short mm -hmm. and compact. Mm -hmm. But then uh, when I first read uh, his Kaddish, mm -hmm. it's on and on and on and very obscene and then on and on and on, never stop. And that really impressed me a lot. Mm -hmm. And meantime, at that time, I was really crazy about Neil Young. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the you know that? Yeah, yeah. and uh, Johnny Mitchell. Uh -huh. And then, you know, I didn't, I wasn't very, not good English, so I tried to read, I just, I tried to understand what he was talking. The and lyrics, you know, mean? Lyrics, lyrics, but then, okay. now I understand. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes it's really kind of nonsense, you know? And then, but at that time, didn't understand. So I tried to understand, and every single word mm -hmm. sounds very nice for me. Mm -hmm. So I uh, think, think I packed in, buy a pickup, take it down to LA, and that word didn't understand at all. What does it mean pick up? Mm -hmm. What does it mean take it down? Mm -hmm. Now I understand. I'm living in San Diego, so take it up, uh -huh. you know, take it down. So he was living somewhere up yeah. north and take it down. Okay. But uh, that kind of word, word to word, mm -hmm. I don't know, it's not uh, take it down mm -hmm. or pick up, mm -hmm. but then uh, much bigger things, mm -hmm. you know, I imagined a lot. So mm -hmm. I got influenced. Five minutes? Yep, five minutes, okay. great. <laughs> okay, so how about I 
I wouldn't be uh, writing the kind of fiction I write now if I hadn't encountered American culture, and uh, I wouldn't be myself if I hadn't encountered America. Before that, I would like to talk a little bit about my father. He was born in 1943. <coughs> uh, so he grew up in post-war Japan, and he grew up watching TV programs like The Combat, uh, Roll Height, and what's the other one? Oh, that's the, uh, the longest day. That's the film. Okay, longest the longest day. So, so when I was a kid, I watched TV programs like I don't know anything. Knight Rider. Knight Rider. <laughs> so you know what she's talking about. <laughs> 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 so, so and whenever he uh, uh, watched news about uh, about politics, about the war, uh, uh, my father always said America is right, not Japan. Uh, my father died uh, in 2004, and our last uh, conversation was about the war in Iraq. However, he uh, never went to America, and he didn't have any American friend. So his love of America may sound a little bit extreme, but uh, it may be a kind of representative of how he felt toward America uh, in the post-war uh, age. I've been taking granted, uh, taking America for granted, and I've been in, I, I was, I was uh, in my, uh, teenager back in the 80s, 90s, and I enjoyed uh, pop culture from the 1960s and 70s. Mm -hmm. So I listened to uh, Jimi Hendrix, uh, Janis Joplin, and my favorite band was the Velvet Underground. <coughs> Uh, what I can mm. call the days of my youth. Mm. Yes. Ah, alternative rock. <laughs> <laughs> alternative rock, so. <laughs> so, so it is. Um, <laughs> yes, um, my first short story, inspiration. Mm. Was inspired was, by? Was, was inspired by um, music video of uh, The Smashing Pumpkins, 1979. <laughs> I love, I love the music video. I also love films, and America for me uh, 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 is a world in films. Jim Jamosh, David Lynch, and uh, David Lynch. David, David Lynch. Lynch. Los Angeles, David Lynch. <laughs> Los Angeles for me uh, 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 was David Lynch's creation. Mm. Oh, no, John Tarantino. John 
Around that time I graduated from college, I started reading American fiction. Writers, uh, writers like Raymond Carver, Paul Auster. The, uh, the American author who has been most influential to me is Phil K. Dick. About young creators, uh, filmmakers, <coughs> novelists, I feel not so much uh, the difference uh, between cultures as the fact that we have been sharing uh, the same uh, 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 age and uh, 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 regardless of the, of the, of the nation uh, without the border. I came to America the first time back, back uh, two years ago, and uh, this is my first visit to Los Angeles. The last time was to New York. The place we've uh, never went to. I, in my case, uh, I, I actually came here, but uh, I didn't uh, come to America for a long time. So the place uh, we didn't go was such a big part of, of our identities. And what does it mean? That would be one of my subjects in my uh, in my fiction from from now on. Are the America for my father and the America for me uh, the same place or different places? That uh, I would like to write about too. There's a Palestinian poet, Darvish. Uh, he says, uh, if you write about a place, you are uh, uh, the uh, inheritor, successor of that place. When I, uh, whenever I write a place in my fiction, I, I, I uh, remind myself of that phrase. Thank you. talking about uh, yeah um you know I was born and raised in Los Angeles and I, I don't know if, if if you needed to translate or not do you know uh, I translated for for them uh, okay no I, I don't I don't think the audience would need a translation okay whatever you yeah. want to do I, I was born and raised in Los Angeles and there was always a sense even though I had to leave for a while to recognize it, that Los Angeles was a, was an artificial place to begin with. Um, and that the and that the sense of place and time was always pretty fluid. Um, I grew up in a part of LA that was still uh, was in the process of transforming from rural to suburban to mega suburban <laughs> within a decade or so. And, and it was a place partly, I mean, it was the San Fernando Valley that was partly 
built by Hollywood, but it was mostly built by aerospace. This is when Americans were on their way to the moon. So the neighborhood where I grew up, um, you know, was a couple miles away from a makeshift frontier town that had been built for Westerns, while at the same time up in the sky were the vapor trails of rocket tests going on in the Santa Susana Mountains. And so that kind of a juxtaposition of, um, of things that didn't naturally go together. I think sort of engendered in me the 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 um, elusive sense of time and place that I wound up writing about. Even even when it took took me a while to recognize that, even when it took me a while to recognize that was why I, I wrote about it. And that that, you know, that that um, constantly shifting sense of time and place was sort of in the DNA of LA. Um, and now I think you know the there's a, and, and I say this hopefully without sounding arrogant about it because that's not my intention. But that there's a way in which time and, and space in general feels Los Angelized, you know, um, <laughs> feels feels a lot like it's been. Made into Los Angeles, everywhere, that that um, that artificiality of, of of time and place. Um, and then you know when I went to Tokyo, uh, would I, and and I've only been once, and it was 17 years ago. It's obviously a very different city from Los Angeles, but there were things about it that felt uh, it, it, that like Los Angeles felt like a a Frankenstein city where time and place was was kind of cobbled together. And, and so it was a very natural place for me to write about in in my novel, for And it was a very natural place to put a young woman from California. So that when she wakes up in her hotel, one morning the front door is, as you said, going to deposit her in this part of Tokyo and the next morning in that part. Uh, you may think that uh, most of Haruki Murakami's fiction has been translated into English. Maybe some of uh, Michael's students, uh, uh, for Michael's students, uh, what, uh, what I'm going to say may be obvious. Actually, his first two books have not been translated to English officially. Uh, 
Well, that's because Haruki uh, regards those two uh, earliest books as, as a kind of immature books. But uh, I like to talk about the very first one. アメリカ人の作家デレク・ハートフィールドっていう作家を村上春樹さんがでっち上げて彼の生涯とか彼が書いた小説とかを引用してそれを主人公が愛読しているっていう設定なんですよ。It's called uh, Hear the Wind Sing and in it uh, Haruki invented an American writer named Derek Hartfield and uh, the uh, narrator uh, is a fan of his books and uh, Haruki invented Hartfield's uh, biography and uh, uh, books he wrote. しかも村上春樹さんはこの小説の後書きで、自分はこの小説が終わった後デレクハートフィールドのお墓をお参りするためにアメリカに行ったという嘘までついてます。Besides, uh, Haruki gives the afterword to the novel in which he claims that after uh, finishing his book, he went to America to visit the grave of Hartfield. Even though he had never been to the United States when he published that book. だからその自分がアメリカ行ったことがないのに書いてあるっていうことに対してもこれは未熟だなと思ってるのかもしれないとは想像します。One of the reasons I would imagine he would uh, he sees that book as immature uh, was because he had never been to the United States at that time actually. しかしこの本は日本人の僕にとってはとても面白いです。主人公は18歳で、この本を僕が読んだ時も18歳でした。But for me, uh, as a Japanese, I see it as a very important book. Uh, the narrator is narrator. Is 18? Oh, okay, okay. No, the narrator goes back to the the time when he was 18 and I was 18 when I read the book first. あの、僕18歳の僕にとっては別にアメリカ行ったことがない人がアメリカの作家をでっち上げたりアメリカに行ったって話を書いても全然不自然でないようなのがあのさっき柴崎さんのお話しましたけども日本文化の中にあったような気がします。In Japanese culture, it was quite natural for us to write about a place, write about America when you have never been to America. Actually, it was quite natural in our atmosphere. これを読んだのは僕18歳って言いましたけれども、18歳の時に初めて東京に出てきて、それまでは日本の地方に住んでました。I came to Tokyo first when I was 18. Uh, before that I had been living in in up, up north. とても田舎でですね、え、山と山、さらに山と山で、要するにちょっと盆地です。クレーターのような中に僕が住んでいます。We were surrounded by mountains all over and uh, it was kind of a Greater like place I lived in. So, I have an older brother who, who is nine years old, older than I am, and he took me to, uh, to the movies while I was uh, 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 from the fourth grade to the sixth grade every week. Every, every week. Every week, okay. Double feature. Double feature. I was about 10 to 12 years old, and I was so I must have seen more than 200 movies uh, while I was 10, 11, 12. But uh, uh, as I think back now, I realize that 90% of those films were made in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. So I was in the back, living in the backwoods, but uh, uh, in, in, uh, at the movie theater, I, I uh, 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 digested the, uh, the uh, uh, entire different world from the out, uh, different world from the outside. So we were living in the backwoods and uh, I uh, was speaking a very different language and dialect from the very different from the standard Japanese language. 
この辺りもしかしたらエリクソンさんの吃音生あのどもりというのも近いのかもしれないんですけども18歳に東京に出てきて3日経ったら標準語で喋れるようになってたんです。This might be uh, 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 have something in common with uh, uh, Steve Stutter. But anyway, I、uh, came to Tokyo and after three days I was speaking the、uh, standard Japanese language. So, I was speaking the standard Japanese language. So, I was speaking the standard Japanese language. So, I was speaking the standard Japanese language. I started reading serious fiction when I was 18, but I didn't make any distinction between、uh, Japanese literature and international literature. So, I was in the city of Tokyo, and 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 I was in the city of Tokyo. Uh, you know, you, you live in, back,、uh, in the mountains and you come to Tokyo and you realize it's such an、uh, international place with uh, uh, lots of uh, restaurants uh, over, over, over foreign foods and uh, uh, lots of cultures from、uh, different countries. So it's a multinational place, Tokyo. そんなふうな東京という環境にいたから海外文学あるいは日本文学という区別をなしに読んできたのではないかなと思います。So、ただ、今度は25歳の時にある小説を読んで自分は小説家になってみたいな、なれるあの小説家というのはとてもスリリングじゃないかと考えるようになりました。Uh, I read a certain novel when I was 25, and I started thinking it might be a very thrilling thing to become a novelist. So, I was in the first place, and 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 I was in the first place. Uh, that, that was, the book was uh, uh, 100 years old by Garcia Marquez. So, in the first time, I was 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 in the first time. And it occurred to me that、uh, in, uh, I thought in this book、uh, uh, there is an unknown outside, unknown place that, I've been,、uh, that I haven't been familiar with. You come to the place, you, you live in the mountains and come to Tokyo, but you see many things, but those are all familiar things from the movies and so, such. But、uh, when I encountered Garcia Marquez's novel, I, I for the first time encountered an、uh, uh, unknown place, unknown thing, and that's what uh, literature uh, gave me at that time. That's it.、Oh, yes.、Huh? Sure. <laughs> oh, because I have told. <laughs> because I was told by Moto, like、yeah. talking about、uh, what kind of.、Uh, You know, foreign literature to, you know, I got the i n t e r e s t But then, just first, say something.、Sure. And I'm listening to people and about, you know, more, most, more like a topos,、sure. right? The place,、mm-hmm. you know. And the reason I came to this country and then settled down here was、uh, actually、uh, I was so interested in American Indians' oral oh, traditions. Okay. And then we have very beautiful translation by. Kanazeki is,、mm-hmm. is the na- name of a、yes. man. But then this、yeah. translation, you know, we have very strange wrong tradition、mm-hmm. to translate like a black, you know, how do you say, African American、uh-huh. or slave's、mm-hmm. language、mm-hmm. into some dialect. Ja- you, yeah, the yeah. Japanese dialect,、mm-hmm. you know, never existed.、Mm-hmm. But then it sounds very rural dialect.、Mm-hmm. And then American Indians as well.、Mm-hmm. But this translation, he translated into a Very modern,、uh, how do you know? How do you know? You know, you don't know, it's not you know, very、uh, neutral, yes, very yes. neutral language. And then when I read it, I was maybe late 20s, 
I was so shocked, and it sounds exactly like a, you know Japanese oldest poetry, mm -hmm. which was written or maybe not written, but you know, recited. You mm -hmm. know, like seventh century, sixth century, or eighth century. That, that, and if you translate it into modern Japanese, it would be same. Mm -hmm. And then uh, lots of you know reference to the nature or you know all the world. They say was almost like a casting spell mm -hmm. so like a, you know yeah you will kill your enemy you will kill your enemy you will kill your enemy or you know the someone who who is going to go to the deer hunting mm -hmm. so i'm here i'm here just here just here and deer is coming deer is coming or something like that and that's exactly what i really wanted to do because i i'm a tokyo native and then uh, you know but they're not really like a you know hectic part mm -hmm. But you know, I'm really Tokyo native, means the Tokyo native people are living there with having a very strong Tokyo dialect, mm -hmm. which is different from yours, mm -hmm. different from yours, mm -hmm. but you know, still it is not really the same from the uh, Hyojun, how do you call it? The standard language? Yeah, standard mm -hmm. Japanese. But then also they are really superstitious and then, you know, working class, so really, you know, I didn't like the culture when uh -huh. I was a child. Uh -huh. But then, uh, so my parents or my grandparents, they are kind of believe something like uh, I couldn't believe. And then when they, you know, like, uh, you know, still now Japanese, if Japanese kids are little <coughs> one and they cut a hand and crying, it's an old mother said, itai no itai no tondake. Uh -huh. It's kind of casting spell. I mean, your pain, your pain, go away. Uh -huh. And then the kid, stops crying mm -hmm. and then so it works you know mm -hmm. and then my parents uh, is, uh, no, no, my grandma was a kind of sorcerer or something magician in oh, so. yeah middle in tokyo <laughs> and she was kind of praying something <laughs> and then god comes and then you know that you know yeah in, you know after the world war ii uh -huh. no 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 <laughs> before the world war ii so yeah. you take after her Huh? You take after No, you I, I don't. I can't do but that. My mother could. <laughs> but anyway, so then, you know, she could do that and that kind of culture. Mm. So since I was just a little and then I started to, you know, write poetry, I really didn't want to write the poetry, mm. contemporary poetry, which is much more like a, you know, kind of koshona. <laughs> How do you call it? Uh, sophisticated, sublime, yeah, like a yeah, sim yeah. symbolism, yeah, or subtle, yes, and, yeah, that, ironic, and that, and yeah, that. something like that. I really wanted, you know, like a poetry actually can work on my real life or mm -hmm. practical, mm -hmm. like my grandma used it, you know. So you know, that's why I came here. Uh, then, then, you know, then. Uh, very easy to read, you know, American Indian, the other tradition, mm. very simple language, you know. But then one word I didn't understand at all. Mm. That was, uh, I can't say that. Mm. Rat rattling darkness. You know, we rattling can say R and L, but this is R. So like a rattle. Uh, rattle. You know, rattling darkness. Uh -huh. And I didn't understand at all. What does it mean, rattling darkness? And I asked my friend, uh -huh. he grew up in Texas and uh -huh. Kansas. He told me, you are living in that kind of, you know, monsoon mm. place and you wouldn't mm. understand. Mm. In this area, that was Pima or something, in mm. Arizona or New Mexico, that area, night is mm. actually rather, oh. you know, very dry. Mm. So you should go to the mm. United States. That's one of the reasons I came here. Absolutely. And I really wanted to see the coyote. Coyote. And, oh yeah, mm. there are lots of, you know, uh, you know, stories about the coyote. Mm. We don't have coyote. We have fox and some other, you know, so the badger dog, but you know, they actually act exactly the same way as coyote, but you know, I really wanted to, you know, see coyote. Also, when I was a child, I loved the story <coughs> by Ernest Thompson Seaton. Mm. Do you know that? Okay. <laughs> A very famous Canadian writer. Anyway, so about the you know, story about animals, so coyotes. So I came to this country, and then for first of all, three uh, months, and I really wanted to see coyotes, but then I couldn't. All I saw was dead on the road. Mm -hmm. So road kills. So road kills are very mm -hmm. impressive for me. Mm -hmm. So everything is dead on the road. Mm -hmm. So.
Yeah. Or was three minutes. I'm so sorry. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> so, so why don't we listen to you uh, uh, reading your, your own poem? Yeah. Uh, actually, I really wanted to read that, uh, you know, Kawara mm. Alexa, but oh. you know, I don't have time. <laughs> I'm the only one who actually keeps the time. <laughs> No, you can read the Kawa extra. Yeah, we are, we are making good time. Yeah, so okay. It's up to you. Yeah, but then you said yakisoba, which I think. Yeah, yakisoba is great too. Ah. Okay, so I read this. Okay. okay. Yeah. Since I'm a, I'm a you know, middle aged woman and live in San Diego for a long time, and then I feel myself is a, not really like a, you know, Japanese, real Japanese, and much more like a. Japanese American, but then Japanese Americans, uh, they do have some tradition or kind of histories, mm -hmm. you know, back to the World War II, but then uh, I don't have that. I So call me as a new Japanese American. It's almost like uh, living here, like uh, no intention to go back to Japan, stay here, the, my kids here propagating, but still, you know, Japanese. Then uh, I think, you know, you can see that kind of stuff. You know, like a, a store called Mitsuwa or Nijiya or Marukai or these places, you know, the selling Japanese food. And of course, in uh, San Diego, we have that kind of store. And then uh, when you go there, you see so many people, Japanese people, new Japanese people, old Japanese people, or, you know, or already American, but then it looks Japanese. They are coming to buy things. And then, you know, like my family, I have three daughters and two brought from Japan and one was born here. And they do speak English more than in, uh, Japanese. And sometimes I, when they speak to me you know, in English, I'm just ignore it. Oh, I don't understand. So they actually reluctantly speak me in Japanese again, and then uh, I correct it. That kind oh. of way I've been doing it. And it was, you know, one of those store, I saw a woman who was doing a promotion, selling something, and they called out in a mixture with the Japanese and English. She said, Chotto Oksan means, hey mom, yotete, come close to me. Then she shows all the kind of product. Good sauce are included to you. <laughs> That's a really mixture of the Japanese and English. And then I was so surprised. Oh, she's speaking like my daughter's language, or like me. And that's how this poem was made. Yakisoba. One day at the market where all the Japanese American go, someone called out and stopped me in my truck. At the corner of the mall is an izakaya, the Japanese drinking place, where they serve simmering daikon and seaweed. Next to that is a curry shop, where they serve Japanese favorite curry, but we call it kare. Next to that is a Japanese style cake shop, where they serve strawberry shortcake, and in the fall, green tea cake with chestnut and red bean paste. Next to that is a Japanese market. An old woman works there. Her job is promotion. She yells in English with a strong accent, probably in her late 60s, probably born and raised in Japan. Came here when she was young. Left here is probably longer. Never really done. She uses only Japanese with her family. When she speaks in Japanese, her children and grandchildren respond only in English. So today, just now, she yelled and stopped a single woman like this. Chotto-okusan yotete, good sauce ga included to yo. I was the one she stopped. My mind spun as I stopped. What the heck, who on earth is her yelling meant to stop? What kind of person, what background, what gender, what station in there? What does she want to say to the person she stops? And that is me, the one who shares those things, the language, the gender, the age, the station in life, 
the interest, the financial values that this lady was targeting. That was what was going through my mind as I took a sample of her yakisoba and taste it with so much nostalgia. I took a bag of yakisoba thinking, Ara, kore wa rather cheap da wa ne. Examined it and threw it into the shopping cart that are there. Throw them all. Arigato. She says, yeah, I say. Here is a woman who comes back alive, who comes back dead, who connects with the next woman, with tens and hundreds and thousands of women, with generations and tens of generations down the line. Onna ga iru, koko ni. Ikikawari, shinikawari, ikikawari, shinikawari, ikikawari, shinikawari, ikikawari, shinikawari, tsunagaru, tsugi no onna ni. Nanju nin to naku, nanbyaku nin to naku, nanzen nin to naku. This point is actually not really like me. Usually I'm writing much more kind of queer stuff. So it doesn't have any sex or no harakiri or no blood or no anything here. So very kind of nice cream pot. <laughs> okay, next uh, we ask Tomoka to read a short story. Uh, it takes, the story takes place in Os yeah. Osaka and Kyoto, but uh, uh, toward the end you be uh, encountering someone from America. You are, uh, most of you must be familiar with. We'll be showing the uh, English translation on the cover on the, on the screens. <coughs> Uh, like the last time I was in New York, uh, the, the, the moments I realize I am in the United States now are the moments I hear the sirens of the, of the police car. It's like that. So I was calling a friend of mine in Japan, and uh, she heard the the, uh, the siren of the police car over the phone, and she said, "Oh, America." <laughs> So this story is about a high school student uh, living in Osaka back in 1992. <laughs> かつらでドアが開いた瞬間にびっくりするほど冷たい空気が車内に流れ込んできて大阪と京都は違うのだということがいっぺんに分かった天王山を越えると国が変わるだけど今はもう京都の空気の方に慣れてしまっていてドアが
ドアが閉まって電車が動き出すと傾いた光の差し込む車内は足元の暖房のせいもあって暖かすぎた明日も別の大学を受けるためにこの電車に乗るどこも受かるとは思っていなかったそういう雰囲気の高校だった2ヶ月後に自分が何をしているのかわからないのって面白いと思った何度か京都に通っているうちにだんだんと覚えてきた家やマンションや田んぽやパチンコ屋が同じ速度で行き過ぎるのを眺めていた知らない人たちが通う学校の広々とした校庭では野球部が成立整列していた天王山が間近に迫りくすんだ深い緑の木々の塊は冬の終わりの日光によって明るいところと暗いところがくっきりと分けられていたすみません隣の外国人が言った少し発音しにくそうではあったけれどそれなりに言い慣れた感じのするすみませんだった私は彼を見た私はピーター・ジャクソンと言いますカナダから来てキリスト教会の仕事をしていますはい彼の曲がりくねった金髪は光に透け目は緑色だった緑色の目はこっちを見ていても見られているような気がしなかった言われる前から教会の人だろうと私は思っていた前にこういう顔の人がうちに時々来た彼らは必ず2人だった目の前にいる人には相棒はなさそうだったカーキ色のコートにオレンジ色のナイロンのリュックを膝の上で抱えていた「こんにちはこんにちは私は同じように返した山田」とは名乗らなかった彼は穏やかな微笑みを崩さずに言った「私は23歳ですおいくつですか18です18」彼は顔中の筋肉を動かして目を丸くするという表現にぴったりの顔になり一段高い声で言った「本当に二十歳かと思った」「お世辞」と思ったいつも年下には間違えられるけれど年上に見られたことは2回ぐらいしかなかった釣り革と釣り広告が同じリズムで揺れ窓の外の家のベランダで洗濯物を取り込む人が見えた「学校行ってきましたか?」彼の向こう側に座るよく太ったおばさんが時々こっちを伺うように見た私が逆の立場だったらきっと見ると思うえー、っと受験で大学に入るテストを受けに「フォーテスト・オブ・ユニバーシティ」間違っているさっきまで受けた英語の試験もできた気がしなかったけどおおそれは大切な日ですねあなたの希望が叶えられるといいですねピータータは大きくうなずき、心から私の幸運を祈ってくれた。この人はきっと本当にそう願っただろうと思った。神に仕える人なのだから。うーん、私は申し訳ないような気がしたから、目をそらした。向かいのシートには真ん中に4歳ぐらいの男の子を連れたそばらしい人が座っていて、私たちの後ろの窓の外を指して何か言っていた。その両側の2つずつ、計4人は全員眠っていた。足元から出る熱風のせいで寝てしまうに違いない。私も眠い。また来年頑張ります。あなたの努力は報われると思います。彼は真摯に言った。次の駅に着き、扉が開いた。閉まる寸前に向かいのシートの端に座っていた紺色の作業服を着た中年の男が誰かに脅かされたように目を覚まし、振り返ってちょうど真後ろにあったホームの柱につけられた駅名のプレートを確かめると、慌てて立ち上がって電車を降りたその人が降りるのとドアが閉まるのが同時でドアは一度その人をはたん挟んだ後、ごとんと音を立てて開き今度はぴったりと閉じたホームに降りた瞬間からその人はゆったりと歩き出し私たちから遠くへと離れていった何の勉強をするのですかピーターの目は緑色だ薄い色で目の中が透けて見えるようだったなんでこんな目で見えるのか不思議だった哲学か美術史ピーターは首をかしげた目は薄い緑色だった細胞の境目が見えそうだったフィロソフィーとヒストリー・オブ・アートどの程度通じたかは分からなかったけれどあーはーとピーターはうなずいた難しいですねとピーターが言ったのでそうですね今度は私がうなずいた自分のピーコートのボタンを撫でながらピーターに質問した。日本にはどれくらいいるんですか ?6 ヶ月ピーターは頭上で揺れている釣り広告の方に目をやってから自分で確かめるように答えた。釣り広告には4年以内に大地震と大津波で日本崩壊、死者300万人と地割れをイメージして火火の入った時代で書いてあった。
コートのボタンが取れたの。日本はどうですか ?How about Japan? How do you think about my country? ピーターはにっこり笑った。いいところですね。金色のまつげは硬そうだった。綺麗だし、とても便利です。みんなとても親切です。ピーターは思い出したようにリュックサックを開けて名刺を取り出した。白い四角い紙には「なんとか教会なんとか派」と書いてあったが何がどう違うのか私には分からなかったピーターは「ピーター・ジャクソン」とカタカナで印刷された名刺を裏返した右手にはいつの間にかボールペンを握っていた日本の名前を考えてもらいましたピーターはそう言いながら電車の揺れで震える線を綴っていき何もない場所にできていく道をたどるように私はその線を目で追った名刺の裏には漢字で「ピーター・ジャクソン美しいに多いに弱いに損する」と書き込まれていた「ピ」の右上には小さな丸があったたどたどしいけれど正確に書かれたその文字をじっと見つめて私は言った「誰に教えてもらったんですか友達」とピーターは言ったが私の反応が芳しくないのに気づいたのか眉を八の字に曲げた外国の人は顔が器用だ間違えてますか間違えてはないです。私は答えた。何か他にいい漢字を教えた方がいいと思って、いろんな漢字を頭に思い浮かべていた。それとも修行僧なのだから、野球選手で42いや49、死ぬとか苦しむとかを背番号にする人がいるように、マイナスの意味の漢字をわざと選んだのかもしれないと思った。<笑>将来は何になるのですか先生。ピータータが聞いたたので答えたよく行きたいです。一月前に受けたセンター試験の倫理の問題文にそう書いてあった。冒頭にあったその部分を読んで動揺してしまった。点数が足りなかったらあのせいだ。ピーターから目立った反応が返ってこないので私は言った。小説家、オーサー。発音が悪いのか、ピーターはまた曖昧な微笑みを返した。ノベリスト。私が言うと、ピーターは、おお、素晴らしいですね。と言った大阪駅からバスに乗り換えた1人掛けか窓際の席に座りたかったのに空いてなくて2人掛けの席に座った窓際にはジャニスが座っていたバスが動き出すとジャニスが窓の外を見たまま聞いた「まっすぐ帰るの?」さあ私は一旦答えてもう暮れた群青色の中に白い光をいくつも輝かせている高層ビルを見上げていった「多分ねさあそう」ジェニスは相変わらず窓の外を見たままだった<咳>ムートンのコートにレインボーカラーのマフラーをしていた<咳>茶色い髪は伸び放題だったジャニスが見ているらしい隣の車線を行く車を目で追いながら私は言った去年ジャニスの映画見たでライブの場面で下の階の女には恋人がいて私にはいなくて下の階の女をか観察したら早起きしてただから私も早起きすることにしたって話してたやろジャニスは何も言わなかったパイプ椅子が並ぶ会場で上映されていたジャニスのドキュメンタリーフィルムを私は夏休みの最初の日に見たあれ私めっちゃ好きなんやん欲しいものが手に入らない時どうすればいいかわかる努力するのよっていうやつ字幕で努力の上にトライと書いてあってジャニスがトライを歌い出すその瞬間が私は本当に好きだった。ジャニスは窓に肘をついたままだったけどやっと私を見た「あんた努力してんのわからない」「あんたが努力してるかどうかはあんただけやで」うん3つ目の停留所でジャニスはバスを降りて堂島川沿いの散歩道遊歩道を西に歩いていった窓際の席に移った歩道にいた犬と目があった家に帰ってからピーター・ジャクソンスズメの村という字を思いついた桂四尺の弟子みたいな感じもするし俳人っぽい並びでもあると思って満足したが名刺に書いてあった教会には連絡しなかった何年かしてニュージーランドの女子高生が母親を殺す映画を見た監督はピーター・ジャクソンという名前だったその監督はさらに何年か後に小人が指輪を捨てに行く映画をとても捨てに行くとても長い映画やキングコングの映画を作ったが阪急電車であったピーターには全然似ていない。<笑><笑>
just like yeah. to uh, make a couple of comments. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. uh, with your questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, along this uh, idea of, of, of place and, uh, I guess, dislocation, in a way, I think was something that uh, all of you addressed, in a way, in your discussions of place. Um, there's location, of course, and then there's feeling dislocated or feeling um, divorced from place. Um, I thought it was very interesting. I, I love to hear uh, writers, both Japanese writers and non-Japanese writers, describe Tokyo. I should mention that I live a half of each year in, in Tokyo, Japan, sometimes more than half, and the other half in New York City. Um, so. I had this experience of looking at the two cities really side by side, going back and forth. And it struck me that uh, in Steve's beautiful description of the city, which is a sort of uh, a city, a hall of mirrors in a way, in the way I see it th through that description, um, he describes it. Uh, at one point, the narrative, I should say, the narrator describes it as the most labyrinthine city in the world. Um, and if you've been to Tokyo, you know that it's uh, all sorts of circuitous alleyways and back streets that uh, sometimes don't really lead anywhere or anywhere uh, logical. Um, but it occurred to me, by contrast, when uh, Shibasaki-san or Furukawa-san describe a Tokyo in their work, uh, it's, it's almost second nature. It's just the city. It's the city with buses, it's the city with neighborhoods called Ginza and Shibuya and Akihabara. But it's not necessarily the most anything in the world. And that I think is quite revealing of the author's perspective. You know, when the description is the most labyrinthine city in the world, it's clear that the, the voice is depicting it in the context of the rest of the world. <laughs> there's, a, there's a whole implication there that the author or the narrator is describing it in the context of the wide world. So most labyrinthine compared to Rome, compared to New York, compared to Los Angeles. Whereas uh, when Shimasaki san describes the city, it's the city seen through the usually female character's eyes, buses, uh, strangers on the bullet train, etc. But it's just city. It's just city. And I shouldn't say just city. It is city. <laughs> and similarly, Furukawa's, it is city. It's the city where the monsters are, are crashing through the neighborhoods. But it's city. And I think that's an interesting uh, way to think about where the voice is coming from, where the city is being seen. So we've seen, obviously, Steve Erickson write about uh, Tokyo. Mm -hmm. He's an author, as you just described, who largely grew up in this area, in Southern California, and saw this uh, Eric, uh, sorry, area uh, metastasize in a way. Um, but I'm wondering if, I'd like to ask, I guess, both Chibasaki-san and Furukawa-san and Ito-san about setting a, whether they've ever considered or ever set a narrative in a foreign city, or a city that is not native to them? You mean outside Japan, or not necessarily? It doesn't have to be outside Japan, but it could be just a city oh. that's not your home city. Did they ever try to write yes. about the Yes, or, or is that it? Yes, 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 or is that it? いや、あの、僕あの、ペメリックさんに翻訳してもらったベルカ、ウェナンカっていう本があるんですけど、マイクルトランスレートブックマイアコールトラベルカワイトチュバーク。それは半分はソビエトとロシアの話で、パフォー
今度ロシアも出るんで去年あのロシアのブックエアネに参加させてもらいました。So the Russian、uh, translation is coming up soon and we I went to a book fair in, in Russia last year. それで読んだ人批評家の人とかが君はソビエト時代とか最近何度もロシアに来てるんだよねって言ったんで初めて来ましたと言ったらとても驚いて。So I met、uh, some、uh, critics in Russia. And they thought I, I,、uh, I had visited Russia already a number of times, and they were very surprised、uh, that when I told them that this was my first visit to Russia. <laughs> so, one of the critics wrote that the, uh, uh, the dis- discussion about the, Soviet U- the gangsters in the Soviet Union back in the ni- 90s、uh, was very real. なぜそんなことができるのかといえば、僕にとって生まれた時から世界はアメリカとソ連という2つの,あの共産権と民主権に分かれてて、もう絶対変わらない世界だと思ってたんですよ。And、why was I able to do that? That's、uh, partly because、uh, in, in my, since my childhood, the world was divided into two parts America and the Soviet Union, and that kind of、uh, the, uh, dichotomy I thought、uh, would、uh, last forever. それが僕が25歳の時にソビエト連邦というのは消えてしまったんです。And then,、uh, when I was 25, the Soviet Union just disappeared. その今まで絶対あると思ったアメリカと対立し続けると思ってた世界が失われというショックはソビエトの人、ロシアの人と僕はあまり変わらなかったような気がします。So the fact that something、uh, that I thought would be as lasting as the United States、uh, suddenly disappeared was, I assume, shocking. I mean, as shocking to me as it was shocking to the people in the Soviet Union in Russia. The year the Soviet Union uh, uh, discontinued uh, back uh, was 1991,、uh, which is when also the Gulf、uh, War happened. この時もアメリカと中東の戦争のように見えるけれども、それで日本はどうするんだという大きな選択を迫られたり、日本って何だろうとすごく考えさせられました。And, uh, uh, East, but, uh, uh, to, uh, do to どんなに遠い場所で行ったことがない場所で起きたことでも。それが自分の体を引き裂くように自分の人生を揺さぶったら当然現地にいる人と同じように書けるんではないかなと僕は思っています。If something hap- even if something happens very far away,、uh, if、uh, that thing、uh, shakes you as seriously as、uh, it does、uh, people there,、uh, I-, I believe that I can write about it as realistically as、uh, people can、uh, over there. いつも自分の小説の中では小説に書くのは実際に自分が行ったことのある場所がほとんどです。Mostly I write about places I have, ever, I have been to myself. 何かこういう場所を書きたいというのが先に立ってあるわけではなくて実際に自分が行った場所、行ったことのある場所で面白かったとかこんなところが気になったとか書きたいっていう。I never think like, you know, oh, I would like to a place like this, even though I've never been to a place like that. I always、uh, think about the specific place I've ever been, I've been to and、uh, think of interesting things、uh, that happened or interesting I saw there, and that's、uh, how I start、uh, with places. Everywhere I go, I always find something interesting, and that is sort of the,、uh, becomes the material for my fiction. Some writers point out that uh, uh, the place I wrote about was familiar to them. But uh, uh, she uh, uh, managed to uh, uh, point out something、uh, they had missed or that 
something uh, that was unfamiliar to them. So I write about those familiar places, but hopefully I write them, uh, uh, I reveal those places more deeply, and hopefully uh, those uh, places I describe uh, might lead to uh, new places, or the places I write about uh, look suddenly uh, new to, to the readers. Not here. Yeah, bo 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 both of you obviously write about displacement uh, in a sense. Um, so, Steve, I guess, you know, what, I'm curious if it is or was, should I say, liberating as a, as a novelist to explore Tokyo through this character, a, a, a city you did not grow up in. Uh, was it confining? Was it restricting? What was the experience like? Um, well, I'll, I'll back up a second if I can. You know, there was there's a famous American songwriter of the 19th century uh, named Stephen Foster. Um, he wrote a lot of songs about the South. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, he had. He had visited the South once in his life for a few days no. over the course of over the course of a honeymoon that must not have gone very well. <laughs> and it, just as there's there's something, just as there's moral authority, there's also the authority of imagination, which is to say, if if you can lie really persuasively, uh, it becomes true in the context of fiction. And, and I, I became a writer very young so that I could make stuff up. And if I don't fully understand a city like Tokyo, which I don't, I can make up a, a revolving hotel that will deposit the main character in parts of Tokyo that have nothing to do with each other. So, um, in that sense, necessity becomes the mother of invention. I grew up in a city that is a very strange city. It it doesn't it's not it doesn't have a, a center of gravity the way most cities does do. It's, it's really defined more by entropy. It, it, it's a city where things are constantly being propelled outwards. And I didn't realize that until um, I left Los Angeles and went and lived somewhere else and came back and saw it from the kind of perspective that you're talking about of somebody who has to see something in a new way. Um, and it, it is on the one hand liberating in the way you were talking about, but there's a fine line between being liberated and being untethered. And I think a lot of my, my books wind up being about that. A lot of my books wind up about being wind up being about the dislocation of the psyche as much as anything else. Uh, my, my books are filled with characters who are essentially nomadic, even when they're in one place. Um, and, and I, I think that's one of the things that, I, that uh, I mean, we talk about displacement, but there's also the subject of what the impact of displacement is on the people that we're writing about. As much as you know, this sense of um, 
all the, the, the pixels of time and place not being quite connected. <coughs> the effect, effect, the effects of displacement on the self, uh, the the psychological effects yeah. of displacement, um, are very much uh, the center um, of uh, the latest book uh, to be published. Um, in translation of Ito's work, which is over Ito-san's work, which is here, Wild Grass on the Riverbank, very powerful passage she has been reading of, about um, the immigrant's experience uh, and feeling like an invasive plant, actually. Yeah. She's a poet, you know, not the writer or, you know, novelist. So I'm not interested in uh, how people live or, you know, how the city works. So I'm not interested at all. I'm much more interested in uh, you know how plants you know grows and how I can describe it, and then so you know I write most my 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 poem is not really like a poem short one. Mine is have a, you know some kind of narrative. It more have stories, but then I only write somewhere I know very well and I can describe it. But then, uh, you know, like uh, when I, like you, you know, I understand what you say. I was living in Japan. I didn't realize that how grow, you know, how the plants grows in Japan. And after I getting out from Japan and Japan is really monsoon and then rainy season and then plants grows really well and all the invasive plants comes to Japan and grows and that kind of way. And in California, Southern California especially, nothing there. Just sagebrush and then the cactus and so on. And if you, you don't water them, and this year we have very serious drought and we don't water them. So it's really even sagebrushes are dying. And then I feel in an Eucalypt tree. And then so, you know, I, I'm much more interested in how eucalypt tree are kind of falling off, how sagebrushes are growing. And then, meantime, when I came here and went back to Japan, how shiny the green during the rainy seasons are. And then also, you know, I'm so interested in plants and, and the invasive plants, how they grow. And then I wanted to kind of describe, you know, at the riverbank, uh, invasive plants are kind of swaying in the wind, and I tried to describe it and couldn't make it in that summer. So I came back here and I went back there in the next summer, and I tried to describe it, not really quite. And then I went back again, and so took just a little piece, took three years, how to describe it. And the meantime, about the places, since I'm a poet, I really want to emphasize it. In Japanese traditions, you know, and uh, the classicals, we have a, a kind of tradition, it's a kind of genre, it's called michiyuki. And it's, for example, like a, uh, like a bunraku or a kabuki, uh, when they want to do the, the double suicide, you know, commit suicide, they move from here to there and then they die. So the Michiyuki is almost like a road movie or a road novel or a road poetry and just talking about, you know, road. And then the same thing you can see the no as well or any kind of narratives, you know, you can see that kind. Of. But these people are not, you know, contemporary literature. So they don't care about, you know, how realistic they make. But just, just make, you know, kind of how to con how do you say? It's kind of a list of the name, uh, place. Like uh, from here to San Diego and Pasadena, Los Angeles, and some, 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 and some, 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 and then reach to San Francisco. Or just the name of the place. And then that's really reality and the people, you know, se you know several hundred years ago. Uh, because at that time, people mostly settled down in one place, never went out from the town. And then so some kind of you know nomadic people came and they are kind of poets. So they are telling a story and then talking about the places. So 
That's it. And people can actually imagine the place. So name, names of the places is actually a big deal. And really, you know, I write that kind of novel, uh, poetry several times. And uh, in that novel, uh, poem, I actually do the same thing. Uh, no question that um, um, the, the, the description of the fecundity of mm. the soil and the types of plants and their sensuality is, is a, a, a bedrock of the, the work. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, when I, I mentioned this the other day, there's these passages where the, uh, the immigration officer at the airport says there's a spot on your passport, there's a spot on your yeah. passport. There are recitations of these lines about these people have lost their languages, these people have lost their land, these people are... There's a very powerful psychological sense of displacement, of alienation, of dislocation. And I feel like that tension yeah. in the poem is... is Maybe I feel very powerful. strong we have an immigrant. Yeah, no, yeah no, no, no. that's why, yeah. But it's, I think that question, you know, that we've all been talking about, mm. is coming at a place from outside yeah. the place and coming back to a place you think you knew. Right. It's very much a part of, of right. all, all four of these writers mm. in the works of fiction. And with that, I'd like to make sure we get time for you to ask questions here um, with all of these writers assembled in one place. And, uh, what kind of questions would you propose to ask? Yes, yes, sir. I mean, I, I feel like in some cases, you can hear kind of American music, but you're in Tokyo, right? So it's like rock music, or you'd be for some jazz music in Tokyo. So then, when you write about it in the novel, do you think more about being in Tokyo and hearing this music, or do you think of it as kind of American music? Like, how, where, where's your sense of place? Oh, so so that that makes Tokyo sense. Tokyo For me, music is not so much a vehicle of place as a vehicle of time. あの、バッハを聞いてドイツのことを想像することはないですが、300年前の音楽なんだってことはすごく意識します。When I listen to Johann Sebastian Bach, I don't think about Germany, but I do think that I, I do consider the fact that it was written uh, 300 years ago. When I listen to the Sonic Youth uh, Goo or Dirty, Dirty. Dirty uh, I just think about the fact that the, it was created back in the early 1990s. ただ、今朝iPhoneで音楽かけようとしたときにサーストムーアをかけようとしたらLAなので申し訳なくてかけれなかったです。
but uh, and then it occurred to me that this was uh, Los Angeles, not New York, so I didn't do, didn't play it at, uh, after all. Respect. <laughs> respect. Yeah, respect. I, I, put, I paid respects to Los Angeles. <laughs> Yeah, you know, when I was younger and when I uh, loved rock music, you know, and I didn't understand at all and then um, the world. Sorry, baby, <laughs> I love you. Almost that's it. So actually, you know, I was kind of imagining what kind of stuff, uh, you know. So that is really nice. And I, I thought, do you know the monkeys? The yeah, monkeys, yes. the very famous one, you know, like a, yeah. I thought that was the masturbation song. <laughs> masturbation. And then uh, when I uh, studied you know, more English and uh, read it, you know, maybe not. <laughs> that was really shocking. <laughs> then, uh, you know, so you know, I, yeah, that was not actually, you know, that was not Japanese, mm. but then uh, I could actually imagine so many ways and really. Okay. I, I don't know if music in place. Oh, uh, music in place. Uh, well, s in the case of somebody like Sonic Youth, mm -hmm. I, I do associate them with New, New York, and I make associations with the place. But I think your point is is excellent. That I it, it, they, they're they're more songs are more time issues than than tunnels to another point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would add that as a, um, I'm a half Japanese, my mother's Japanese, and, and uh, so as a half Japanese American living in Tokyo, if I walk into a, conv a convenience store in Tokyo, and some of you know in, in Japan, convenience stores are pristine. They're exquisitely clean, beautifully designed, open 24-7, you can even buy a clean pair of socks in a convenience store in Japan. They're extremely convenient. And walking into a convenience store in Tokyo and hearing Eminem being piped in is a dramatically different experience than hearing Eminem in New York City in a club or in, in, in a mall in Los Angeles. The, and the only thing I can describe is that when I hear M&M in a convenience store in Japan, and people are well dressed and just looking through some magazines or picking up origiri. Um, I almost feel myself paying more attention to the rhythm and melody, and less to the lyrics, because the lyrics seem to matter less where I am. Uh, whereas if I'm if I'm in New York, the li I hear what he's saying, and it seems much more relevant to life in the United States. Uh, but there's, of course, a lot of melody there, too. And if you hear it in Tokyo, it's sort of that's what seems to be singing, is the melody. Sorry, yeah, so other questions? Yes. I'm sorry, the Los Angeles? Los Angeles. Uh, location of the world. And I wonder if others have felt something similar to that, the kind of flattening of place, place, place in the city. How do you feel about that? Is it something that is enjoyable to you, or is it something that you resist in your own sort of I lived in Poland uh, uh, since you know still that was under communism, and then at that time uh, Poland was my first uh, foreign country, and then Polish was my first uh, foreign language I spoke. Actually, I learned in English, you know, school, but it never be good. So you know, and then uh, that was shocking because so different from Japan at that time, you know, the mid '80s. No, no, actually, no, no, early 80s and then mid 80s. 
and then uh, so different. And then I thought, you I can't imagine what the European culture through books and music. You know, you know, I love classical music, so I can't imagine. And but then the real Poland, you know, in that time was so different. You know, the, if the culture is like this, our culture is here, and American culture here, uh, we saw this very close. But actually, you know, Poland is. The other side, that mm -hmm. I, I felt. And then, it just kind of, you know, now I feel everything is uh, like a kind of same, mm -hmm. you know, all over. Language as well. And, you know, people use uh, uh, English, for mm -hmm. example. And then also the way things uh, kind of, you know, we consume the things and then uh, EU or, mm -hmm. you know, what? TPO? Mm -hmm. Like uh, everything is kind of trying to say, and um, I really don't like it to mm. tell the truth. And then I wanna be much more, much more different from you know, yeah. Really, that, that is strongly mean, against. Did you mean TPP? The, the TPP trade or something like that? that? Yeah, yeah. 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 or oh, something, something. Yeah. It, yeah. So many, you know, problems we have. Yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah. yeah I mean, I, I think what I was getting at, and maybe that was poor choice of terminology, but the, the, the distinctions between plays or among places do seem to be breaking down. And, and one city starts looking more and more like another city. And the sense of the way we define place becomes more digital. It becomes more horizontal. And um, and as a result, becomes increasingly more homogenized, probably. Mm -hmm. Do you like it or not? No. Oh, okay. No, I, I, no. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like you. I would like to go to, um, to I'd like to go to, um, you know, Warsaw and, and, and have look and feel like Warsaw as a, as, as opposed yeah, and have Warsaw. Dublin Warsaw. look and feel like mm -hmm. Dublin mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. um, but I just I, I think that you know as it becomes more and more one world and as it becomes more and more interconnected and all those cliches mm -hmm. that we hear uh, you know like a lot of cliches there's some truth in them yeah. and um, and it, it, we, we start to lose that that individuality of place, and I, I think that's a shame. But then also, you know, language as well, or literature as well, and you know, like a, you, you write in, a, you know, English, so you can actually reach so many people all over the world, but we are writing in Japanese, and we can reach that little. But that's where translators come in. Yeah, <laughs> translators, translators. But then once I, I attended, you know, I participated in you know, a conference between Japanese writers and then Indian writers. And then everybody, you know, we sit down and, uh, you know, first of all, they asked us, so what kind of language do you use? Mm -hmm. But we went there as a, you know, Japanese writer, you know, so, oh, of course Japanese, but uh, that's not their notion. Mm -hmm. So each writer has their own languages. And then they, they assumed you were huh? writing in English? And then some people actually write in English, but then among them, you know, people are using English. They are actually, you know, the other people who are writing in their you know, native languages, they are talking about the people who are writing in English that they are lacking of something. Mm -hmm. They are losing some Indianness. You know, mm -hmm. and then the people who are writing uh, their own languages, they can keep their own culture, but can't reach readers. So I actually, at that time, you know, that was actually the, somebody's problem, not mine, because I was just concentrating on Japanese-ness and the Japanese language, but now I'm living here, I really feel it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then I can't write, you know, in English, so I have to write in Japanese. And I need translation, but then, uh, yeah, so, you know, make it flat, all, you know, whole world, united, you know, same, it's good, but then, uh, I don't know, and then our minor culture, you know, we have a lot of uh, disadvantage, I think, I'm so sorry.
、うん、あのただあのマイナーな言語だからこそ間に翻訳者が入らないと英語にならないみたいな時に誰かが自分の作品をもう一回解釈しようと自分の作品をものすごく迫ってくれるんですよね、うん、でその大事なのは想像力の価値で強度で、うん、あっ Uh, so, you use a minor language, you write in a minor language, so、yeah. there has to be a、uh, translator. But that means that the, somebody is, is trying hard to understand your work and、uh, that there is imagination going on there. あの世界中がロサンゼルス化していくとしたら普通の人は放っておいても同じ方向に想像力を使ってしまうので、うん、一人一人の作家というのはこれと別の方向に想像力を持っていこうと思う。Yeah. Okay, if, uh, if uh, 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 all the places in the world are becoming、uh, more like Los Angeles,、uh, people might be heading in the same direction, but the writers are the kind of people who, are, who try to go in other directions. So people go this way, but writers go down this way, and the depth, how deep you can go in is the, is the you know, values. で翻訳者は翻訳者はこの深さのことを考えない限りあの英語に置き換えられないんです。で誰かがこの深さに近づこうとしている。Okay, so the American writers of, of、uh, American works uh, uh, read books and、uh, they don't really have to you know, think deep and、uh, they, may, uh, they may read books but, but, but they may not reach the depth of the book. Whereas a translator、uh, really has to go deep to, to, to be able to translate the book. Maybe this may be a loser's remark after all, but a、uh, but, uh, 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 minor language uh, uh, has that、uh, power or, 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 uh, or compels you to try that kind of thing. And maybe it's an opportunity. <laughs>